Today, our speaker is Farouk Fatoyev. He obtained his PhD at Florida State University, and afterwards he was a postdoc at Texas A&M. And now he's a postdoc at Indiana University, and he will tell us about connecting neutron skin skins to gravitational waves. So please proceed. Thank you very much for, for the introduction, and uh, thank you everybody for coming over to hear uh, our recent work on connecting neutron skins to gravitational waves. I'd like to thank also Gina for giving me an opportunity to present this seminar. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with Paul Kepi Paris and, and Chuck Rowitz. Uh, was accepted by PRL yesterday, actually, uh, on connecting neutron spins to recent gravitational waves from binary neutron star mergers. Uh, as uh, I move on, I would like to give a little introduction about uh, what happened. So a few months ago, on August 17, 2017, two neutron stars got merged and they produced gravitational waves that were eventually detected by advanced LIGO and Virgo detectors. And the historical gravitational wave detection has uh, uh, have been followed by 70 uh, uh, observations that, that mostly uh, concentrated on the electromagnetic counterparts and had already provided many insights into uh, various astrophysics, gravitation, cosmology, and also the nature, nature of dense matter, which I am going to talk about. Uh, in one part, in particular, uh, this gravitational wave signal has given a very tight constraint on the so-called tidal polarizability that I'll discuss soon of the two neutron stars, um, which is strongly correlated to the neutron star radius and therefore to the neutron skins of medium to heavy nuclei, which I'll discuss them soon. So I'll discuss these uh, observations and analyze some. Uh, of the impacts of the current and future laboratory measurements of neutron spins uh, to the tidal polarizability and gravitational wave signals and vice versa. Uh, to get us all in the same page, I would like to give a little a brief introduction of uh, why neutron stars are referred to as a giant nucleus. Uh, it was uh, several decades ago and first proposed by Landau in one of his trips to Copenhagen. He, uh, independently from Chandra Secker, he uh, uh, found the fate of white dwarfs, uh, and in fact found the limiting mass of about 1.5 solar mass uh, that uh, the white dwarfs could not uh, bear the degeneracy pressure of the electrons. Towards the end of his paper, though, he, he tried to analyze uh, large stars, and uh, at the time neutrons were not discovered, and he wrote the following uh, statement that the dense mass of matter becomes so great that the atomic nuclear becomes in close contact contact, therefore forming one gigantic nucleus. And he speculated that this would violate quantum mechanics uh, because neutrons weren't discovered and it was discovered a year later. But as soon as neutrons were discovered, then um, uh, Bahad and Tricky uh, explained that supernova must represent the transition from our ordinary stars to neutron stars. There have been several papers written on this in 1939, first theoretical papers by Coleman, Oppenheimer, and Volkov, two papers. And many other theoretical papers explaining the role of pulsars and explanations of some phenomena, astrophysical phenomena. But it was only in 1967 that the first neutron star was discovered. And here is a, a brief uh, description. It's a cartoon showing that uh, what's the similarities and differences of neutron stars and the nucleus of an atom. Uh, for a heavy, medium to heavy nuclei, we have about hundreds of baryon numbers in the nucleus. Uh, on the other hand, neutron stars has, uh, have 10 to the power of 57 orders of magnitude larger baryon numbers. The average density of the nucleus is about 0 0.7 saturation density, uh, whereas the average density of the neutron star depends on the mass of the neutron stars. And for, for some canonical neutron stars, it's about two saturation density. Uh, one is supported by the surface tension, and uh, the other is supported by gravity. And uh, the sizes are obviously 10 to the power of 18 orders of magnitude. There is 18 orders of magnitude difference from uh, 10 per mis to 10 kilometers. Now, uh, here I, I plot uh, using uh, some uh, mean field calculations, I plot the density distribution in the nucleus of an atom as well as in the neutron stars for two different equations of state. Uh, on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you will see uh, that uh, 
for nucleus of an atom, the only species needed is, is neutrons and protons, and the differences in the equation of states is presented in this uh, density distributions. Similarly, for neutron stars, you do have um, neutrons and protons, but uh, neutron stars are charge neutral, so you have to impose charge neutrality and better equilibrium conditions, and you may have electrons, muons, and many more species. And the density distributions are kind of similar. You, 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 as you start from the center of the nucleus or neutron stars, uh, the density decreases towards the surface. And the sole ingredient is required to both of them is the equation of set of neutron rich matter. So whether you want to build a nucleus of an atom, both is going, governed by the same nuclear forces. Now, I would like to talk about a little bit about tidal polarizability and how is it connected to the equation of state. Before that, uh, just recall the electric dipole polarizability, where you have an induced electric field uh, acting uh, on an atom and producing this uh, dipole moment. The coefficient of which is referred to as tidal uh, dipole polarizability, which scales as radius cubed. Here is the uh, dipole operator is squared, but the Coulomb forces is the inverse of radius, so you, you get the radius cubed. But the gravitational uh, field state do not have dipole moments because of the conservation of moment momentum, and therefore you have to introduce the quadrupole polarizations. And in particular, um, if you have an external gravitational field, then it would impose a quadrupole deformation on the second star, which uh, the coefficient would be referred to as uh, tidal deformability or tidal polarizability. And this one is scaled as registered power fifth. Again, the gravitational field is scaled one over R, and you have a quadrupole uh, operator, which is R to the power fourth when, when the matrix elements are squared. So this contributes to the gravitational wave on emission. And here is a neutron, two neutron star in spiral. As, as they merge uh, towards close to the merger, the tidal fields um, from one star causes a quadrupole deformation on the other. So you have electric external gravitational field from one star causing a quadrupole deformation on the other star. And this coefficient is scaled uh, to the fifth uh, power of the radius. And here K2 is referred as to tidal love number. And lambda is referred to as tidal polarizability. It's very important to note that uh, th this uh, fifth power of the radius uh, and that the sensitivity of the radius to the equation of state, all discussing. So, what happens uh, to the gravitational waveforms? As two neutron stars get merged uh, uh, towards the end of, of the merger, so before, let's consider a black hole black hole merger. For example, these are two points like. Uh, you can consider them point like objects as they merge the gravitational wave forms is very well described by simply by, by the uh, frequency determined by the orbital motion. But when you have two neutron stars, on the other hand, uh, the potential, the gravitational potential is now enhanced by this gravitational uh, uh, tidal deformation. Therefore, this particle deformation advances the orbit towards the merger. As you get closer to the merger, it advances the orbit and therefore changes the rotational phase. This image was taken by from Jocelyn Red's uh, slides, and here you can see that towards the merger, the, it, it merges much earlier than uh, than the two point mass would merge. Here are the differences, and the advance in this uh, uh, gravitational waveform therefore is uh, has traces of uh, the quadrupole uh, deformation or tidal polarizability, which can be measured from gravitational wave observation of fine neutral star mergers. And that what, that's what was done. And here uh, is another example of showing what would happen if you have a compact star versus a very large star. So a large star, uh, as they merge together towards the merger, they collide much earlier because their radius is larger. Therefore, uh, they merge at lower frequencies. But when you have a compact star, the merger continues until later time, and the frequencies uh, at the contact point is much higher. Here is a, a calculation, a numerical uh, calcul relativity calculation done by Takami et al. And here you see that uh, for a fluffy star, for example, uh, the, uh, first of all, you see the, the, the advance in the waveform. The blue is a large one, so you have larger tidal deformation, and the red is the compact one. You see uh, some advances, and also you see that, that they merge 
at a later time, whereas the compact the large ones merge, merge earlier. So the calculations of tidal def deformability or polarizability is done uh, through finding first tidal love number, which is a function of compactness, really. Here, Rs is the short chain radius, and this is the compactness parameter. And the only thing that the compactness is sensitive is to the equation of the state of the stellar structure. And also, you have this function calculated at the surface of the star through this differential equation, which is also a sensitive function uh, for the equation of state, which is a relation between energy density and pressure. So in calculating the tidal deformability in the same way that you calculate the equation of state stellar structure and find the mass and radii of the star, the only input that you need is the equation of state of neutron each month. Here, I plot uh, the mass radius uh, predictions for two different equation of states, showing that the soft equation of states uh, results in a very compact star, whereas the so-called stiff equation of state gives larger stars. Mm -hmm. And the corresponding tidal porosity here is dimension let the full tidal porosity in the units of 10 to the power 36 centimeters squared to the second squared. You find that the compact stars give smaller tidal polarizations, and whereas the flux stars they give very large tidal polarization polarizability. Now, what's the current uncertainty in the equation of state? Uh, it's mostly related to the so-called symmetry energy. Before uh, I explain symmetry energy, let's consider the equation of state being as pressure and density as a function of energy density as a function of density and the so-called isosphere symmetry. And for a neutron rich matter, it's useful to expand this around the so-called isosphere symmetric nuclear matter, where the first term would be referred to as the binding energy per nucleon of symmetric nuclear matter, whereas the coefficient of the second term is referred to as the nuclear symmetry energy. Now, the uh, binding energy of symmetric nuclear matter, or the equation of state of symmetric nuclear matter, is more or less very well constrained. Uh, here I choose some uh, various uh, coefficients, second order uh, coefficient of the density expansions, which are referred as to, to incompressibility. And for various incompressibilities, you see most of the equation of states are more or less the same. And only at the very high densities, which is about 0 0.5 uh, uh, per mean minus 3, then you have uh, some deviations. So. In my words, one can say the equation of set of symmetric nuclear matter near separation density is very well constrained. Maybe at higher densities, there are some uncertainties. But on the other hand, when you expand the symmetry energy around saturation densities, even uh, as saturation densities value is not very well known, but when it comes to the slope, the, the uncertainty is very large. Uh, here, uh, you can think of the nuclear symmetry energy as the difference between the pure neutral matter equation of state and uh, symmetric nuclear matter equation of state. And the slope of the pure neutral matter equation of state is essentially the slope of the symmetry energy. And models predictions uh, show a variety of uh, curves, as you can see, for equation of state of pure neutral matter as a function of density. I compiled some RMF and skirmish mean field uh, parameterizations, and you get a very high uh, diversity in the density dependence of the pure neutral matter at high densities. And even at saturation densities, you have a variety that they differ a lot. And some parallel effective field uh, theory calculations, which are initial calculations, and also some initial calculations for quantum Monte Carlo, suggest that uh, there is some uh, consensus that is reached that uh, one can say the equation of set of pure neutral matter nowadays is getting more and more constrained below saturation density. Uh, nevertheless, other model calculations such as mean field still give a variety of uh, uh, equation of state that differ at high densities. Now, in this uh, exploratory study, I used the equation of state from the PC mean field model, which is based on the Lagrangian interaction with Lagrangian for uh, nucleons that exchange mesons. And there are three mesons involved here, which is scalar as a scalar. As a scalar uh, vectorizer scalar and vectorizer vector mesons. And you can think of them sigma meson, uh, omega meson, and rho meson. And uh, the high order terms were introduced to uh, get the equation of set of symmetric nuclear matter near saturation correct. And some high order terms of the uh, quartic term in the omega meson was introduced to get the neutral stars with large masses. 
this term was introduced to get the density to tune the density dependence of the nuclear symmetry. So most of these parameters, GS, GV, and kappa lambda are extracted from a fit to nuclear masses and giant resonances. So nuclear, uh, final nuclear properties already uh, constrain these parameters very well. However, when it comes to the uh, Z parameter, which is the portic term, this can only be constrained by the observation of the maximum mass of the neutral star. Current constraint says that it's it's static constraint within the range of 0 0.03 here. But the upper constraint comes from the maximum observed two solar mass neutral stars, and the lower constraint can be shifted towards um, uh, higher limits, uh, especially from the recent observations and subsequent electromagnetic uh, observation that that explained that they, depending on the uh, fate of the merger, one could get a uh, a maximum mass, man could set the maximum mass of the neutron star to be about 2.17 uh, solar mass. But so you can say that this is more or less constrained. Uh, when it comes to the uh, isovector uh, component of the equation of state or the effective Lagrangian, these parameters are not very well constrained because of due to the lack of the data that are sensitive uh, isovector probes. So we do not have uh, enough. Uh, experimental data on that. Uh, therefore, we get models that predict the properties of fine nuclei very well, but when it comes to predict the as a vector observables, they vary by a lot. For example, the FSU goal 2 relativity two model gives the neutron skin of lead to be 0 0.29 per me, but it can tune these two parameters to get a family of models that very well describe the properties of nuclei, however, give uh, neutron skins of uh, between 0 0.15 to 0 0.29, even can get larger. So current RMF models are, which are very accurately calibrated to the properties of nuclei and neutron stars, give anything for the neutron skin that is from as low as 0 0.12 per me to 0 0.33 per me. Now, how do we measure neutron skin? Uh, there have been several measurements, and in particular, the measurement that I'm going to concentrate is from priority violating experiments, where you uh, uh, have a highly polarized electron beams uh, on, on the target nuclei, uh, which probes. Uh, so, uh, so the, 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 the electron beams have been used in the past to probe the proton distribution because the electric charge of the proton is one and the neutron is zero. So the, the electrons usually see, let's say, protons. Therefore, the charge distribution was very, very long since 1960s. But when it comes to the neutron distributions, uh, you need some kind of parity violating experiments that can model independently uh, describe the weak charge distribution of the neutrons, in particular, the parity violating asymmetry, which is basically the difference in the cross sections from right handed and left handed ones, uh, is very sensitive to the uh, neutron and proton form factors. The proton form factors are very well known because the proton distribution is very well known in the nuclei, and this is more, almost zero. Uh, therefore, the parity violating asymmetry is really uh, constraining the neutron form factors, which is the Fourier transform of the neutron densities. So the PREX experiment at JLab and the CREX experiment that's proposed will uh, measure the neutron radii with about 100% accuracy. And there is an experiment at MICE that plans also to measure the neutron radius with even larger accuracy. And again, I would like to point out that proton char weak charge is not zero, but it's very small. So this is more or less very cleanly uh, probes the neutron distributions in the nuclei. Therefore, you get the neutron skin. Now, uh, there has been already one experiment in 2010, uh, but due to some uh, uh, radiation errors, they, they got uh, the initial skins uh, of 0 0.33, but with very large statistical error bars. And so, QXT is aiming to measure this with higher accuracy of about 0 0.05 per mis. And here is a dense distribution given as a function of radial distance for two. Uh, um, models from FSU Gold showing that the proton distribution is more or less the same, but the neutron distribution is different. Therefore, how much the neutrons stick out of protons, that difference, little difference, would tell you uh, 
the, about the neutron skin. So how is neutron skin correlated to the, I mean, how, how is the equation of stress sensitive to uh, the neutron skin? It, you can think of the neutron skin is uh, formed because um, the pressure of pure neutron matter pushes against the surface tension. Therefore, the larger the pressure is, the larger would be the neutron skin. On the other hand, the pressure of pure, uh, pure neutron matter is correlated with the dense slope of the nuclear symmetry energy. So if you know the neutron skin, you know the density dependence of the nuclear symmetry energy at saturation. And there was a very nice plot by Shariro Kamasa that showing that neutron skin is indeed very well correlated with the slope of the symmetry energy for various models, relativistic and relativistic models. And this same pressure of pure neutron matter pushes against gravity that forms the neutron star radius, although it's a little bit more complicated, so if, if you recall. And so the neutron star radius and neutron skins therefore uh, originate from same dynamics, and therefore uh, the larger the neutron skin you get, the larger would be the neutron star radius. In fact, we have shown that uh, using correlation analysis that neutron skin of lead in particular is correlated with uh, a host of neutron star observables given here, like, such as the neutron star radii of uh, low mass neutron stars and some uh, cooling properties as well as moment of inertia of the crust, etc. Now, what did this gravitational wave observation 1708-17 did? Uh, the, the gravitational waveforms, uh, the frequency evolution of the gravitational waveform already gave you, gave us a very accurately measured chirp mass which determines the leading order amplitude in the frequency evolution. The chirp mass was very well determined. However, the total mass of the system is, depends on the mass ratio of, of the stars, which is not known, as well as on the spin of the stars. So assuming uh, low spins, uh, then you get um, uh, a very tight co constraint on the masses as well. And if the high spins, then, then the, the total mass could be a little, uh, more, I mean, the, the masses could be of the two binary could be uh, different. Notice that uh, most of the neutron stars that uh, merge in the Hubble time prefer the low spin. So now, uh, assuming that they are constant, uh, they are equal mass, then you get uh, uh, about 1.365 solar mass from this chirp mass. So obviously, one of the star is heavier, so and the other is smaller, then, then you get uh, this relationship. Now, uh, the, the, the tidal polarizability that was ex extracted from this uh, detection uh, is sensitive to the so-called uh, red average tidal polarizability, which is defined as the individual tidal polarizabilities uh, weighted through the masses. Uh, and it was found that by with a 90% confidence level that this tidal polarizability, weighted average tide, weight average tidal polarizability is less than about 800. This is a dimensionless tidal polarizability scale with uh, this compactness parameter, inverse of the compactness parameter. So it is less than 800. And again, I know that I, uh, I refer to these gravitational waveforms. You see that the compact star here gives a very small tidal polarizability. On the other hand, large stars gives large tidal polarizability, and you can see the, the advance in the waveform here for the large ones, and also a, an abrupt uh, disruption, which means that they got merged, whereas the small ones continue to merge. So the waveform really tells us this lambda uh, to a very high accuracy. Now, uh, what we did was using FSU Gold family models first and try to see if we can uh, have some uh, idea of what would it require on the neutron skins. Remember that the title of the polarizability is scaled as the fifth power of the radius and uh, plotting the tidal polarizability of a 1.4 solar mass as a function of the neutron skin as well as neutron star radius. You can see that models as, as the neutron skin gets larger and the tidal polarizability becomes large. Again, in this FSU goal two family, the equation of, of state of symmetric nuclear matter is exactly the same. And it's only the neutron skin that's changing due to the change dense dependence of the nuclear symmetry energy. And we find that all the models that have predict uh, larger than 0 0.28 per mean neutron skin of lead are ruled out by just this observation. 
This, on the other hand, suggests that neutral stars cannot be larger than the 13.9 kilometers. Obviously, this constraint agrees with other observations from X-ray sources and uh, maybe a little upper limit on the neutral star radius. And what if the large central value that was already measured by the PIVREX experiment in 2010 is actually confirmed by the upcoming uh, PIVREX-2 experiments or other experiments? Uh, th these are the questions that uh, would uh, advance our uh, current our thinking and also cur our current modeling of the nuclear equation of state. In particular, I would like to discuss that the average nuclear density in the final nuclear is about 0 0.7 saturation density, whereas the average density of the neutron star matter depends on the mass of the star. Therefore, uh, the two of them are probing two different density regions. So this in particular may suggest that if the neutron skin is very large, then there must be some kind of uh, phase transition to some exotic phase uh, when you get to higher densities. Or I can think of a soft symmetry energy at higher densities. So you get a stiff symmetry energy at uh, low uh, densities, but then if you go higher densities, then the symmetry energy suddenly becomes soft, or the equation of state becomes soft. So this, this could be explored in the future. And, uh, we wanted to do a little bit more robust analysis in the sense that we didn't want to use one family of the models that only uh, uh, tunes the neutron skins but leaves out the equation of state symmetric nuclear matter. We got 10 distinct RMF models that are independently tuned to various uh, properties of nuclei as well as neutron stars. And the symmetric nuclear matter equation of state at these densities, uh, at high densities especially, it becomes important. So especially if you see models, very stiff equation of state, this stiffness is coming from the stiffness of the equation of state of symmetric nuclear matter. But these models may have already been ruled out, especially because they, they produce 2.7 solar mass and not, not entirely ruled out, but there are some hints that they may be ruled out, especially some analysis done recently post-gravitational wave merger. Event. Now, uh, we get, uh, we do try to reproduce the same uh, figure as in the detection paper and plot uh, the predicted tidal probability list of the neutron stars uh, for these various models. This uh, dotted line shows that the two stars are assumed to have the same mass, and we only plot uh, for the uh, top uh, left corner where. Uh, the, the mass of the star lambda one increases and lambda two decreases, therefore uh, the, 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 the tide of variabilities uh, follow these curves. This dashed curve is the 90% confidence level taken from the figure detection paper. And you see that most of the models are al already ruled out. Uh, the detection paper also had some equation of state that had been ruled out, but those equation of state were all, uh, actually uh, uh, outdated, therefore we wanted to make a uh, better analysis. Uh, uh, th this equation of states now ruled out showed that uh, most of the equation of states with the small neutron skins are still in, but this uh, particularly these two equation of states with a neutron skin of 0 0.28 to 8.29 closely follow the uh, the borderline of the 90% confidence level, maybe at the very high extremes when the mass of the one system is very large and the other is very low, they get out of boundaries. And again, I want like to point out that it's not only the neutron skin that's controlling the tidal probability, but the equation of state of symmetric nuclear matter is important. For example, we see that two different the equation of state giving different neutron skins, but this, this one is even giving larger tidal probability. So, uh, In, in, in the same spirit as FSC to FSC Gold, we also plotted the tidal probability as a function of the neutron star radius and the neutron skin. And we show that the 90% confidence level, the upper bound from the gravitational wave observations, uh, rules out these equations. And also one can fit it to a power law and indeed con confirm that it scales to the power fifth and uh, gives a uh, a limiting neutron star radius of 13.8 kilometers, which is a very perfect agreement with the, when the family of the models were used. 
In particular, this model predicts about 0 0.25 per mean neutron skin radius, neutron skin of the lead, uh, which, which is consistent with the other prediction. So any neutron skin in below uh, 0 0.25 per mean is n. So teleporizability constraints the neutron skins to be about 0 0.25 per mean or below. Uh, but Pirex had already imposed a lower bound to the neutron skin thickness of 0 0.15 per mean. We asked a question that what would this imply on tidal polarizabilities in turn? If you actually go ahead and calculate uh, tidal polarizability using this Pirex measurement, and we find that the 0 0.15 per mean neutron skin of lead would suggest that the neutron star radius is about 12.55 kilometer for this relatively similar models. And this, on the other hand, suggests that the tidal polarizability could be as small as about 490 uh, dimensions. So one can say that we, we got a joint PREX and gravitational wave constraint on the tidal polarizability of the 1.4 solar neutron star. And uh, future expansions of PREX to and CREX, for example, and META could make this constraint even tighter. Um, I should note that. Uh, it's not only the neutron skin, again, that, that uh, gives the tidal polarizability, but the equation of state of symmetry in the map is also important. So uh, th this should be explored more as we get more data in the future uh, gravitational wave observations. So I would like to conclude uh, by saying that uh, the historical first detection of this gravitational wave signal from binary neutron star merger has already given uh, lots of insights about astrophysics, and general activity, cosmology, and also improved uh, our, the equation set of dense matter. We connected this observational measurement with one laboratory obser observable, and that's a neutron skin. And this was possible because they were both sensitive to the neutron star radius and via the equation of state. In particular, we found that the neutron star radii from this observation is less than about 13.8 kilometers and the neutron skin radii of lead is about less than 0 0.25 per mean. And again, T-Rex had already provided the lower bound to the neutron skin, which would in turn suggest that the tidal polarizability can be larger than about 490. So uh, the future experiments uh, at JLab or MINDS would uh, provide uh, better information about the neutron skins and therefore give more information about the equation of state at and below saturations. Uh, on the other hand, the future by neutron star mergers, which also comes in both in about 2019, and the, the rate of by neutron star merger is much larger, so they may provide information uh, that, that could be statistically very important and will, will put a very tight constraints on the equation of state of neutron weak matter at supersaturation densities. So there are more exciting opportunities are ahead and I thank you all very much for listening and I'll take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, if anyone has questions, please indicate so in the chat, but I guess we start because we have some questions here. So please go ahead. Okay. This is Sanjay here. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I think in the towards the end, you make a pretty bold and maybe provocative statement that the Tidal polarizability must be greater than 490 because PREX says the skin thickness is greater than 0.15. I'm assuming that this has a lot to do with what kind of model you are using to go from nuclear density to twice nuclear density. You're using a very specific model, uh, the relativistic mean field model, and you can ask yourself, what is the organizing principle for this model to make predictions at twice nuclear density if you give it information at nuclear density? So clearly, there's some error associated with that. And unless we understand, so that means that this statement of 490 has an error associated with it. Uh, so what do you think that error is? So thank you so much for your comment. Uh, yes, I agree totally with that and also, uh, the fact that we, we wanted to be consistent uh, and within one model, uh, which is a uh, relativistic mean field models are uh, covariant in their nature, so their extrapolation to high densities wouldn't involve any uh, 
uh, any let's say errors coming from from the like breaking the speed of sound uh, barrier going over the speed of uh, light and they are they are causal so we use only a three model to predict this but it's true that uh, this is only within the relativity field model and also even within the relativity field model there is error bar on this 490 which we, we didn't put it here but we are going to explore it a little bit more detail and as far as the some softness transition is concerned at high densities let's say at about two saturation densities then that would mean that the, uh, the neutron spin of 0 0.15 for me for example would suggest that the, the neutron star is not as large as it is predicted by 0 0.15 Fermi model. For example, we got 12.55 kilometer, but it could be 11 kilometer or 11.5, which would mean that the tidal probability is much smaller than 490. And so I should say that this is only within the relative seeming field model and also very approximate result. And yes, the softness of the equation of state at high densities would uh, uh, make this, this values much smaller. And in fact, one reason that we would like to know, know that, suppose that the, the PREX or any other me measurement of the neutral skin counts are to be very large, which is uh, predicting that lambdas are much larger than 800. And that, that would suggest that indeed the equation of state somewhere towards uh, one to two or maybe higher nuclear saturation density is much softer than than is predicted by, for example, mean field models such as RCC media. We have another question. <coughs> yeah, uh, this is uh, Jerome speaking. Um, have you looked at the distribution for the parameter Kcm, which uh, somehow guide uh, your density dependence uh, uh, from saturation density to two times saturation density? Do you have an idea of uh, the range of parameters that you explore with these relativistic models? So thank you. Uh, within the relativistic field models, uh, the case seem is is not within this particular model that I used. It has seven parameters. The case seem is not um, uh, controllable in the sense that once you choose your parameter sets, then case seem is basically random. And I do not recall them, but the 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 the, the range of the case seem is very large. Uh, however. Uh, Neutral skins are not very much correlated with the Kcm, but rather with the L. Uh, have um, tidal possibilities on the other hand, or neutral star radii are correlated with the neutral with the Kcm. So uh, within this model, I can't tell, let's say, what would be the range of Kcm that's consistent with our duration because Kcm comes out as random variable. It's just dictated by the seven parameters, and we don't have an additional parameter to constrain it. Okay, uh, actually, I have a question. Which uh, model did you use to predict this 490, and what is your limit on the L parameters that you obtain from the tidal polarizer? Uh, so, uh, the, the model that we used was a twisting multiple models uh, all, all together. So, this 490 comes actually from the lowest accurately calibrated relativistic multiple model that we use. It, it comes from IUFSU model. and, and uh, it's, it's about 500 something, but but we have this correlation. Let me go back a little and then probably show you. So this correlation was used to to get the the relationship between the tidal probability and the radius of the neutral star, as well as the correlation between radius of the neutral star and uh, our skin was used. So you can see that there is a plot here, and we got this this limiting uh, value. But uh, the second question. Uh, was uh, what was the L value on the R skin, right? So, so the the tidal probability gives you about 800. That corresponds to L values of less than 100 MeV, depending on what model you use. So, in, in our models, we found most of them. Th this 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 accurately calibrated model. This this ones I have about 800 MeV, and when we have a FSU gold model, which which is this one, then these values are below 100 MeV approximately. So the L value is constrained, let's say, from gravitational observations to be less than about 100 MeV. 
Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? You can just go ahead and ask. Okay, I think that's not the case. Then let's thank Farouk again. And see you all next time.